What's up, guys? Today I am uh, coming to you live from EdCon here in Toronto. I got my good friend John Powler with me. Uh, if you guys know who John Powler is, John Powler is founder and steward of Ola Op how do you pronounce that? Opolis. Opolis, and also founder of East Denver. By the way, by the way, I've been to a lot of hackathons. In fact, I've personally done hackathons myself. Hands down, hands down, your fucking hackathon was the fucking shit, bro. <laughs> Thanks, man. Like, congrats on that. That was Thanks. dope. Like, custom painting, like, the curation, yeah. the quality, the small details, like, it felt like you weren't even at a hackathon. It's like no. a high, the one of the most, like, high-class events possible. That's what we were going for. That's what we were trying to do. I love it. Thank I love you. it. Yeah, Thank you for my pleasure. It. Thanks for organizing it. Uh, Thank you for supporting it. Likewise, likewise. Uh, so, basically, what I want to talk to you today is about, well, since we're at EdCon here, um, tokens. You know? Let's talk tokens. Let's talk tokens. What was the saying that we said earlier? Friends don't let friends uh, create useless tokens? Yeah, that was uh, Jeff Coleman yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, it was great. Friends don't let friends build useless tokens. Yeah, build useless tokens. Yeah, they don't. And so friends been, don't let friends do that. No. You've been in space for a while. I've been in space for a while. Yeah. And 2017 was obviously a shit show when it came from ICOs and tokens. Yeah, it went from zero to 100 miles an hour in like... Yeah. Real quick. Yeah, real quick. Real quick. And so, you know, we're 2018, Q2 right now. Uh, a lot of talks of regulation, SEC talking about it. A lot of exchanges being banned on a national scale in certain countries. Uh, as you see right now in the ICO space, it's more or less pre-sales as opposed to public sales. Right. <laughs> it actually defeats the whole purpose of originally what ICOs intended to be, a democratized very... Uh, the marketized version of investing yep. was reverted back to the old way of SAFT and pre-sale accredited investors. It's only the rich get richer, right. uh, but obviously still investing these useless tokens. So like in the last year or so, and based on your experience in the space and uh, based on what you know about the technology, like what's your current stance on ICOs and tokens? I, I think generally ICOs are overused. I think that when the SEC says that all, if most, if not all, tokens are securitized, securities at this stage, um, their argument for that is actually not a horrible one mm. because most of the projects don't have any sort of functioning system or software or tool, so there really isn't any utility. It's a future promise of potential utility. Um, as we know, most of the projects never make it to utility, so there's a huge problem with that. Um, I think Wyoming is in the right direction. So from a stateside perspective, um, Wyoming passed some legislation that created a new asset class uh, that basically defines a utility token. Uh, one of the components of that requires, though, that the, that the utility token is actually usable at the moment of issuance. Uh. So they're saying, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll allow utility tokens, but it's got to be usable like now. So it's not securities, it's a utility it's token. It's a utility token. Well, what's the definition of a utility token? It's a, uti that? a utility token is, is basically a digital asset that's being uh, sold with use, with actual use for goods and services inside of a technological platform. So it wouldn't be like 90% of these ICOs was literally a payment token. Right, right. Which is, which is very, very, very um, simple thinking in my opinion. It's not, it's not innovative at all. Mm. Payment token, payment transfer is, is like V1 of tokens. Um, I think much more interesting uses of utility tokens are going to be around governance. Mm -hmm. And um, just d more, much more complicated uses of tokens. I, I don't think that you're going to see, um, I don't think it's going to be, I don't know if fashionable is the word, but I don't think you're going to see people doing things that are going to like, there's going to be a precedent set. And I think once the precedent's set and the hammer comes down on some of these projects, people are going to stop doing certain behaviors because they don't want the same thing to happen to them. Um, what regulation comes down on a national level or even, um, I mean, currently the Colorado State House is considering um, different legislations around this same topic. Sure. It's going to be really interesting to see what actually pops out of that because I think that is going to be really the guidance that gets used for how people are, pre are preparing their projects in the future. Um, so it's sort of hard to tell. Uh, April was the lowest um, 
uh, quantity of ICOs in eight months. So like I think people well, are, are seeing that, that yeah. they're kind of putting the brakes on. Well, this is my take on it. Like, for the most part, 99% of these ICOs they don't even need a token. They don't need a token. And they, can for, they, they can use ETH. They can use ETH. But we can even step back and subtract it a step further. They don't even have a business. Yeah, well, they don't even need a blockchain. <laughs> That's like, precisely it. Yeah. They, so they might have a business, but you don't need to blockchainify everything. Yes. So we talk about this a lot um, in our Colorado ecosystem. Like We get people coming to ETH Denver and, and proposing projects and asking for input and ideas all the time. And the first question we ask ourselves, if not them directly, is why do you need a blockchain? Yeah. And if they can't answer that question, if they can't give us a little, you know, quick, and it has to be compelling. It can't be just, well, you could do this or you could do that. Yeah. But why would you? Blockchain is slower today. Mm -hmm. It's not as efficient. It's more expensive. Transactions cost money. Like, what are you actually creating that's going to solve let's say less of a technological problem sure. and more of a social problem. Like, how does this actually solve a social problem? And if all you're doing is looking for blockchain to create efficiency, you're in the wrong game because efficiency is not the name of blockchain mm -hmm. right now. It might be, you know, once we solve scaling, I mean, there was a two hour panel yesterday here with uh, Vitalik and many other brilliant minds talking about scaling solutions around a technology that doesn't scale right now. So like, yeah, I mean, we're, if, 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 if you're talking efficiency and streamlining things, if you're not truly cr creating a solution for a, a meaningful social problem, then I wouldn't consider using blockchain. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, 99% of these ICOs, like you said, don't need a blockchain. Well, they're opportunists. So. Yes. They're, so there's, there's two different, well, there's several camps that I see in the crypto space, um, and I have opinions about all of them, but I think the thing that's, troubling for me is the ICO space mm. because when you look at the ethos of what blockchain was originally about, even coming from Satoshi's original white paper, it was really around solving a social problem. It was around creating impact and democracy for people and creating just better systems. Yep. I don't see that in 90 some odd percent of the projects that come through. They're opportunists and that's, you know, look, capitalism is a very, very good thing, but but it's a tool. Capitalism is a tool just like anything else. And tools can be used for very selfish and kind of greed-driven purposes. And that just, to me, strikes against the ethos of the space entirely. And so, you know, you're talking about Wyoming. They're making interesting, well, they made the legislation. Yeah, they made it. They passed, passed it. It's passed. passed. It's, the governor signed it. So yeah. Wyoming is officially the most crypto-friendly state in the country right now. Now, that doesn't mean a ton. <laughs> Colorado, um, we believe that Colorado has the same sort of tendencies in innovation, and we should be you following should, suit. Man. We should be, and we're, should. we're working on it. Yeah. Uh, we're working with the governor's office. We're working with the Office of Economic Development and International Trade. We're working with the Colorado Technology Association. We're working with influential lawmakers. We're working with our national congressman, uh, one of which is running for governor. His name is Jared Polis. He's the chairman of the Blockchain Committee at, in, at the U.S. House. He is, um, he made the statement actually at a meetup yesterday, my friends who are back in Colorado um, said that he made the statement that Colorado will be the blockchain capital of the U.S. Now, uh, I don't want to get down the Colorado rabbit hole too much and <laughs> shill Colorado. I think generally, um, you know, it'll speak for itself. But yes, there's, there's, there's going to be some very interesting things coming. So what do you think? Your predictions are in like the next six months, what's going to happen in the industry as a whole? Well, it, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I, um, I don't know that the, the, the space can advance a ton until we solve scaling. Sure. I think that there's, there's, a whole, there's a whole just trail of dApps and... Yeah. But scaling's complex because they're not just I know scaling it. the tech. Yeah, I know they're it. They're scaling the governance with the tech as well. I know it. It's not an easy problem. In fact, yesterday I think somebody mentioned, I'm trying to remember who, that they predicted that a year from now we wouldn't be that much further on, on solving the scalability. So what that means for six months, I think until the regulatory environment calms down, I think you're going to see a reduction in ICOs, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see potentially some 
some interesting things just happening in general markets and how cryptos are trading. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of the opportunists and FUD people are going to go away for a while. Um, and we're just going to build. I think this is. I think probably the six to tw six to eighteen months is going to be a heavy just building period. And the people that are serious about the space are going to stick around. The people who actually believe in the ethos of decentralization and the good that can bring socially and politically to the world mm. are going to do it. They're going to they're going to put in the time and and it's going to be easier to spot legitimate projects because right now it's hard. You know, in a bull market, everyone's smart. Everybody's smart. Everyone's smart, and everyone thinks they're smart, and it's really dangerous business because bull markets don't last forever. No. And it's actually not good that they last forever. So, like, this perpetual, like, let's go to 300,000 Bitcoin and, you know, $40,000 Ethers. Yep. It's like, look, if all you want to do is be in it for the money, go to Wall Street. That's what they're about. That's mm -hmm. what they do. You know, do high frequency trading. Like I know people that financial make, engineering is the name of the game. Uh, it is. It really is. And and I know I know, I've got friends that that have spent time on Wall Street. I've got friends that are professional commodities traders. I mean, these guys are pros. They yep. know how to extract dollars yep. and game the market. And yep. you know what? I don't agree with it. I don't do it. I don't see any value being contributed. So instead of being an opportunist and an extractionist. I'm very much of the mindset of contribution first. So thinking about well, I like the I like what you had on your Twitter profile as steward. Yeah, it's a key word. Yeah. So I don't see myself as a, as an executive of any sort. Yeah. I see myself as a role player. So every team has to have certain players and skill sets come to the table. Mm. Um, I believe in the notion of steward leadership, which is I don't I'm not a uh, I'm a stakeholder, but I'm not an owner. Sure. I'm not a CEO. I'm not a. I don't. I don't believe in that sort of hierarchical governance because I don't think that it empowers people to be creative mm -hmm. and express their best. And that's what we need. We need people. Not just me. I mean, I've got some ideas I think that are interesting. Um, I certainly have no trouble sharing them. I love talking about my thoughts, but I'm also equally as interested in what other people think because Beautiful. I think that that is where you do your learning is through the expression of others. Mm -hmm. And stewardship really gives people the opportunity to become their best selves instead of managing them. You know, I, don't, I, don't, I think managing people is not only an insult to intelligence and creativity, but it's, it's actually sort of a weird way of slavery. You know, I mean, it's, I, I use that term sort of loosely, mm -hmm. and it, may, it might be sort of offensive in some ways, but. If you think about it, it's indentured servitude in some ways. You know, just yes. managing people to do processes and check yeah. boxes. And you know, you look at the so I'm in the employment space, I've been in the employment space for almost twenty years, and um, our project is around decentralizing employment. Yes. Right. So we're Well when are you kinda of plug Opolis? Well, I will do that in a minute. Let yeah. me just collapse my thought here, but you know, so that just to collapse on the um, steward leadership. That gives people the opportunity as, as opposed to management, it gives people the opportunity to be their best, yeah. to express their best. As I say, it's like, express your best. Like, what's inside of you that you were uniquely created to express to this world that can contribute something awesome? Like, what is your, what is your inner badass? What mm -hmm. is that? Because I want to see that. Now, some people are not used to that. They're like, well, what do you want me to do? It's, I, don't, I don't know what that looks like, <laughs> you know? So, Anyway, it's, it's a process and people are evolving and I think the, the thinking and consciousness around this is evolving. I think that um, you know, the next 20 years in the way we engage with work is going to change more drastically than it ever has in like periods of hundreds of years yes. historically, um, largely driven by technology and the democratized systems that we build that actually facilitate that. And you're working on this with Opolis? Opolis, yeah. So Opolis is, is basically... Uh, decentralized employment protocol and what it what it does is effectively give people portable self-determined as I call it self-sovereign not just identity but employment so we have a um, it's a it's a DAO but we call it a decentralized employment organization um, that we're building mm. so this entity construct would allow a group of individuals to consort together mm -hmm. and um, become employed by this entity mm -hmm. 
that would then, in effect, be portable 100% anywhere they want to go. Sure. So this entity would also provide them benefits. They would have um, stake. They would stake tokens. Um, so talk about you, a, a real live use case yep. for uh, decentralized governance um, and tokens. They would stake tokens, and each DEO would have their own set of rules around how many tokens or what the requirements are for membership. Mm -hmm. And then they would vote on certain benefits or different components or features of the DEO that they would want or get. And if they don't like the outcomes of whatever governance decisions are made, they can move to one that fits their social and political beliefs more in alignment. So one feature that I use as an example for this is there's a lot of political talk around uh, UBI, yeah. right? So, you know, libertarians are like, that's bullshit. <laughs> I'm not paying for that. Sure. It's not, it's, you know, taxation is theft. I get it. Like, if I don't want to pay for something, I shouldn't necessarily have to be forced to do it. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about this is, whereas today employment centralized around an employer who makes all these decisions for you, mm -hmm. you can actually align with groups of people not just in a geography, but digitally, that allow you to choose whichever social and political system fits your benefits that you would like to see. Yep. So you could, as a DEO, vote on having UBI as a component. It's amazing. And you could self-tax yourself, you know, and be a part of a key, group. The key, though, that. is um, opting in. Choice. 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 Yeah. It's completely democratic. So if I want to go be a part of the libertarian, you know, group and, yeah. and then just bare bones stuff and I'm young and healthy and I don't really care about saving for retirement or whatever, <laughs> like, I can go do that. Sure. It just costs me less to do it. Sure. And, but then I get to choose that. So yeah. I'm effectively going to tax myself at whatever rate I want to contribute. Yes. And, but my employment's never affected. So I can, so the, the way that we see uh, the future of work is, I call it the velocity of workers, mm -hmm. is going to accelerate. So right now, people are, Half the labor force in the U.S. is going to be looking for work, like right now. Right now. Right now. Oh yeah. And it's going to be a gig economy, like ASAP. Well, 30% of people are already participating, mostly side hustles today. Yeah. But by 2025, you're going to see a large portion of people doing gig full time. Yep. And you're going to see half of the U.S. labor force participating in the gig economy. Yep. By then, so the the old school W two is going to start going down because people want flexibility, they want freedom. They don't. Sure. They don't want the post World War II post-depression era, security, pension, and all that, because it doesn't exist anymore. Sure. There's no, that promise, that age and era has so, is super past. Sure. So I could work for six companies at one time. I could have three of them be international. I could port my employment anywhere I want to go. And if I need to apply for a home or whatever, I have stable employment. Mm -hmm. I have the same benefits. So when I go from project to project, it doesn't affect me Beautiful. at all. Uh, if people want to find more information about what you're doing, yeah. What's the best resource? So um, we're we're in the process of updating our website right now. Okay. So opolis.co, you can there's some information there. We're 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 keeping it sort of thin on the website intentionally. Okay. If you want to get in touch with me, you can do so by uh, John at opolis.co. Uh, follow me on Twitter is at Paller John. Um, and yeah, I, I love talking about this. So the future of employment is is I, I think in my opinion. Um, probably one of the biggest use cases for blockchain. I agree. And it has a practical use. It really does actually solve a major social problem, yep. which I don't know how else you solve it, you know, because you can't just create technology around this. They've tried for 20 years in Silicon Valley to throw $20 billion in yep. solving, you know, the connection problem between talent and work. Mm -hmm. And LinkedIn sold out to Microsoft because they didn't solve it. That's right. And LinkedIn was the hope for solving it. But again, there's, there's just mechanical issues with yeah. that, that model, so, which we're obviously seeing in Facebook and others, the, the centralized data model. And That's what I'm excited about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, John, thanks, and thanks. brother. Thanks for having me. It was a me. pleasure. Cheers. Thanks.